Again, thank you for being here. Uh, I am Mark Wade. I'm the pastor here, and it's been my honor to, to get to see and, and get to experience Jews for Jesus when I've gone to Southern Baptist Convention or been, been at Clear Creek Baptist Bible College and other avenues, and I've always admired their walk with Jesus. I, I got to thinking about this as, as I got an email, and then I, I got to looking into possibly hosting Jews for Jesus here at our church, and I'm excited to hear from them. I've got to experience what you are going to experience when I was uh, at another uh, ministry, and I think you're going to enjoy getting to see how Christ is in the Passover. I'm excited to introduce to you Rachel Landrum. Landrum, Is that correct? Come on up here, ma'am. I'm thankful to have her with us this evening. She comes to us from Romania. No, no, no. I want to pray with you, and then I'm going to let you tell the rest of the story, okay? Now let's pray together. God, thank you for this dear lady. Thank you so much for her ministry and her Christian walk. And Lord, I thank you for Jews for Jesus. And we're excited to hear from her this evening. God, lead her and help her to share with us what we need to hear. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Shalom. I don't know you all, but I know that you can do better than that. Shall we try that one more time? Shalom. shalom. So much better. Anybody knows what shalom means? Peace. That's right. That's how we Jewish people greet each other with the word shalom, peace, when we come or when we go. Probably because we don't know whether we're coming or going. <laughs> but it's my pleasure to be here together with you and worship the Lord together. Uh, my name is Rachel Landrum, and that's partly true. Um, I was born in Romania. Uh, I was 12 my, when my parents and I moved to Israel, and that's where both my parents and I became believers in Jesus. My mother is the first one in my family who became a believer in Jesus uh, through the witness of another Romanian Jewish lady. Um, and uh, together with her, we, my dad and I started going to a, a Messianic congregation, which is like a church like this where Jewish people, Israelis, worship Jesus. Now, it's not an easy thing to be a Messianic, that's what we call ourselves, um, Messianic Jew in Israel. Um, because most of the, the Jewish people, and especially Israelis, think that to be, uh, uh, to be a, um, you cannot be both a Jewish person and a believer in Jesus. Jesus is for everybody else, but for us. Uh, and those of us who are believers are persecuted for our faith, especially in Israel. Um, but that's where, in that congregation, uh, I met Jesus. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, it, it's, it's in the sense like, you know, it's a natural thing. Because Jesus himself was Jewish, right? You knew that? Yeah? That's good. The disciples, his disciples were all Jewish, so it makes total sense for us Jewish people to believe in him. But as I said before, today is just the opposite. People, Jewish people think that it's for everybody else but for us. Um, and that's why I heard outside the congregation. Inside the congregation, I heard that Jesus is the Messiah. So I just really needed to find out the truth. Uh, and I took a very short class with the pastor of my congregation in Messianic Prophecies. Not all of them, because there are over 300 prophecies, just major ones, in the Old Testament about the Messiah. And then I took a, picture, I took a, a look at the picture that, Jesus, uh, the, that the New Testament is portraying about Jesus in the, um, in the New Testament. So I saw that those two pictures, the Messiah in the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures, and the picture of Jesus in the New Testament, I saw that those two pictures are identical. So um, even if I knew that I had to go against the stream of most of my friends and relatives, I knew that I had to follow the truth because I saw it in my own eyes. By God's grace, he allowed me to see that. Um, so at the age of 18, right before I went into the Israeli army, I accepted Jesus as my personal Messiah and Savior. That's the best decision I've made in my whole entire life. But later on, God put it on my heart, not only to keep the love that he had for me to myself, but to share it with others. And that is the reason why I'm a, I'm, I'm a missionary, sharing the love of God with my people. And um, actually, my husband, Mark, um, who um, he's, um, um, he, he just 
uh, um, was born and grew up around the corner uh, from here uh, in Atlanta, Georgia. Probably you say, well, she, she doesn't know her geography. <laughs> Well, actually, when you think about it, actually, Mark, uh, my husband, and I live in Sydney, Australia. That's where we minister with uh, Jews for Jesus um, in a moment. And um, so when you're, you know, so far away, you know, the other side of, the, you know, we call it uh, down, uh, down under, so far away, you know, did I pronounce it right? Eroa? And or Atlanta is sort of like around the corner. But... Um, I'll share with you more about the ministry of Jews for Jesus later on, but I'd like to share with you in a moment, you know, using all these strange elements that you see here on the table, I'd like to share with you Christ in the, or Messiah or Jesus, all of them the same, um, in the Passover. Now, I know that you're going to get a lot of information tonight. You won't be able to retain everything unless you're um, a genius, <laughs> remembering, you know, everything. That's why we have some books in the back that you can, um, and, and some uh, DVDs that, um, that would be talking about what I'm talking tonight. But I hope that at the end of this presentation, you'll, you won't just think, oh, all these, this lots of details and information uh, about this Passover that Jewish people celebrate, but I hope that you'll see this as I do, as an object lesson of the life and mission of the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Because I believe that if you look here closely, you will see his death, his resurrection, and the promise of his return. So I'd like to start with reading from Luke 22. If you have your Bibles with you, I'd like to, open, to invite you to open them together with me. I'll be reading um, Luke 22. <coughs> Sorry. Um, verses 7, 8, and I'll skip to verse 13. Luke 22, 7, 8, and 13. Then came the day of unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. Jesus sent Peter and John saying, go and make preparations for us to eat the Passover. In verse 13, they left and found things just as Jesus had told them. So they prepared the Passover. Well, the first night of Passover begins a seven-day holiday, which is called the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And during this time, we had nothing that contains an leaven or yeast. Why no leaven? Well, throughout scripture, leaven is frequently used as a symbol of sin. A long time ago, a small piece of leaven was used to ferment an entire portion of dough. It was the small leaven that caused the dough to rise, to become puffed up, just as sin causes us to become puffed up in our own eyes. So as a way of saying we want to break the daily sin cycle in our own lives with nothing that contains any leaven or yeast. So that's why in many Orthodox Jewish homes, six weeks prior to Passover, the home undergoes a complete spring cleaning. We remove all the bread, cake, cereal, baking soda, anything that has leaven in it. Now, did you notice that Luke says that Jesus sent two men to prepare the Passover? And that's maybe because in Judaism, it is the man who is standing before God, not only when it comes to praying, but also when it comes to ceremonial preparations like these. So if you think about it, that means that the men should do the cleaning during this time. Amen. That's what I, ex I was expecting, Some, somebody, you know, somebody to, you know, to, to, um, to be encouraged by that. But actually, I'm surprised to see men laughing at this, because you see, my own husband didn't like the idea at all. He tried to find a loophole. And conveniently, he remembered what our rabbi is saying. Now, true, the house is spotless. But it is because the woman has spent six weeks cleaning and removing every speck of leaven. Well, almost every speck, that is. You see, she takes a few crumbs and she hides it somewhere in the house. And it's up to the men to find it. So the night before Passover, he returns home and he takes up some rather strange-looking cleaning tools. They include a white cloth, like this, a wooden spoon, and a feather. And he goes to what we call the kat hametz, the search for the leaven. Now, where could those crumbs be? It can be anywhere in the house. It can be in the basement, in the attic, behind the refrigerator. It can be anywhere. But fortunately, she's been good enough to hide them 
exactly where she hid them the year before. And that's how the husband discovers the crumbs, and with a very steady hand, he swoops the crumbs into the spoon with a feather. Now, since the crumbs represent sin, he's not permitted to touch them. So instead, he wraps it in a white cloth and takes it to a large bonfire in the courtyard of the synagogue where all the men of the congregation have gathered, and each throws his band of leaven into the flames. And then he returns home where he proudly proclaims, Now I've purged my house of all leaven. And now the house is clean, and it's ready for the Passover celebration. And it is a celebration. But you see, my ancestors were instructed to eat their first Passover meal with the sandals on their feet, with a staff in hand, ready to go in a moment's notice. But today we recline on pillars at the table. That's why we have these pillars here. Because you see, in Middle Eastern societies, only the free, only the redeemed could recline at dinner at the table. If you recall the story of the Passover that Jesus himself celebrated with his disciples, it says that they reclined at dinner at the table. For, uh, for them at that time, it was a, a sign of redemption from Egypt. But we have great reason to rejoice today, not necessarily to recline. We can find other ways that we can rejoice over the redemption that we have in him. Amen? Amen. But um, I think we have everything need, we need here to start the Passover Seder. Uh, maybe some of you have heard the word Seder in conjunction with Passover. Well, Seder is a Hebrew word which, <coughs> sorry, which means order because the Passover celebration follows a very specific order of service. And this order of service is recorded in a book called the Haggadah which means the telling, because that's exactly what it does. It tells the story of the first Passover, has the liturgy of the Passover celebration, it has pictures and songs pertaining to Passover. Usually we start with the lighting of the candles, and this is generally the duty and honor of the woman of the house. So I'm going to light these candles, recite a traditional Hebrew prayer in Hebrew, and I will translate that into English. ברוך אתה אדוני אלוהינו מלך העולם, אשר קידשנו במצוותיו וציוונו לד לקנר של פסח. Blessed are thou, Lord our God, King of the universe, who sanctified us by his commandments and commanded us to light the Passover candles. Amen. Actually, I think it's very appropriate that a woman lights those candles because it reminds me that the light of the world, the Messiah, came not, not, came not from the seed of men, but from the seed of woman, and by the will of God. As the prophet Isaiah foretold, Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and she shall call his name Emmanuel, a light to light the Gentiles and the glory of the people of Israel. Amen? Amen. But Passover isn't just a meal. It's um, a banquet. It isn't just a regular service. It's a whole ceremony. And while a meal uh, service takes one or two hours, the Passover celebration takes a total of four hours. But don't worry, I'll let you go before then. <laughs> During this time, each adult drinks from his cup and refills it four times, and each time it has a special name. The first cup is called the Kiddush cup, or the cup of sanctification. The second cup is called the cup of plagues. The third cup, which is the focal point of the entire evening, is the cup of redemption. And then the fourth cup is called the cup of Hallel. And it is with this first cup, the Kiddush cup, or the cup of sanctification, that the host offers a blessing for all the rest of the service that follows. Holding the Kiddush cup or the cup of sanctification in the air like this, he offers praise and thank, thanks to God Almighty, King of the universe, who created the fruit of the vine. And that's how the blessing goes in Hebrew. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam Bore pri hagafen Amen and now we can start the service. And the youngest person present comes forward and asks the meaning of the Passover. He or she asks the four traditional questions that are found in the Haggadah, in the book, the telling. The questions are being chanted, and the first one goes like this. Ma nishtan... <clears throat> Sorry. <clears throat> um, I have a problem with my voice. I usually I'm not very good at singing anyway, but I you know that's even more. Manishtana halayla haze mikola leilot 
which means, why is this night different than all other nights? And those of us who know the story of the Passover are telling them, this is because of what God did for me when he redeemed me out of the house of bondage in slavery to Pharaoh in Egypt, when he redeemed me with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. As you can see, Passover talks about redemption, about being set free. But it doesn't just talk about the message of redemption. It talks about the means of redemption as well. You see, my ancestors were instructed to take a spotless lamb, to roast it whole without breaking any of its bones, and to apply its blood to the doorposts of their homes. First to the top, the lintel, and then to the two side posts. And because of their obedience to God's command, and because of their faith in the effectiveness of God's provision, they were spared the ravages of the tenth plague that fell on Egypt. Because when the angel of death saw the blood on their doors, death was forced to pass over. And that's how we get the name, Passover. In Hebrew, Pesach, the holiday that commemorates the time when the children of Israel were spared, were saved because of the blood, the blood of the lamb, the spotless lamb. Doesn't this remind you of another spotless lamb, the lamb of God? Because just as none of the bones of the first lambs were broken in the death, none of Jesus' bones were broken in his death. And just as my ancestors had to apply in faith the blood of the lambs to the doorposts of their homes, each one of us, even today, has to apply in faith the blood of the Lamb of God to the doorposts of our hearts. But um, now the child asks another question. Why on this night with only unleavened bread? And we explained that our ancestors, in their hurry to leave Egypt, they had to take their bread with them while it was still flat. And one of the items that we have on the Passover uh, table is this one called a matzah tash. And inside it, there are three layers of unleavened bread, called matzah, each separated from the other by some cloth. And during the Seder, the host removes the middle layer of this uh, pouch, recites a blessing, and then breaks it in two. He sets one half aside, and he gives the other one a special name, the afikomen. Actually, this word is not a Hebrew word. It's a Greek word, and it means he who comes later. And that's exactly what happens. We don't eat the afikoman at this point, but for now we wrap it in a white cloth or in a pouch designed specifically for it, and we hide it from view. It's being buried somewhere, and no one else at the table knows what has been hidden, but later on they'll have to find it or the service won't be concluded. But for now the child asks two more questions. Why on this night we'd only bitter herbs and we dip the sop in salt water twice? Well, let me explain by showing you this. This is a Seder plate, and despite its appearance, it doesn't look, doesn't, it's not for stuffed things. A small piece of food from the Passover table is placed into each of these compartments, and together it forms a pe perfect picture of redemption. The first item that we have on the Seder plate is this one called carpas, or greens, and we generally use uh, um, parsley or lettuce. And these greens represent life, but before we eat them, we dip them into salt water, which represents the tears of life. So by dipping it, we're reminded that a life without redemption is a life immersed in tears. And this is called chazeret, and uh, we generally use an onion or horseradish root. And this represents the root of life and how better it was for my ancestors in Egypt when they were slaves and not redeemed. Even today, the root of life is bitter when you're not redeemed. And this is called maror, freshly ground horseradish. Now, we're supposed to eat a tablespoonful of horseradish at Passover. Any volunteers? <laughs> no. You know what happens when, hap when you have a full table, a tablespoon of, of, you cry, of low choice in the matters between the horseradish and your sinuses, and usually the horseradish wins. By the way, we call this the Jewish way of clearing your sinuses. Maybe I should try it. Maybe that would help my, my throat. But like the chazer, the onion, the maror, the horseradish, the grated horseradish itself, reminds us, especially when we have the tears in our eyes, reminds us how bitter life is without redemption. Amen. We have contrast, we have the haroset. And it's, this is made up of chopped apple honey raisins and nuts, and it tastes delicious. I can have volunteers for this one at the end of the service. 
This uh, represents the mortar that my ancestors had to use when they had to make bricks for Pharaoh. But maybe some of you are wondering why such a sweet mixture is used to represent such bitter labor. Well, our rabbis have a terrific answer. They say that even the bitterest labor is sweetened by the promise of redemption. And that's true for us as believers in Jesus, isn't it? No matter what our circumstances in our own personal lives around us, around the world, the promise and hope for redemption that we have in Jesus makes everything sweet in our lives. Amen? Amen. And this is not an Easter egg, although we're approaching Easter. This is called the Chagiga, which is a, name, a, spe- a special name given to a special sa- te- uh, temple sacrifice in Jerusalem. Uh, the Chagiga is a te- token of grief to my people, grief over the destruction of the second temple. And before the Seder, we roast the egg, and that turns it brown. It's to remind us of the ruins of the temple. And during the Seder, we break it open again to remind us of ruins. We slice it, and we give it to each person at the table. And then we dip it into the salt water, which represents what? Tears, that's right. But it's not only a token of grief, because the egg also represents new life. There's new life in redemption. And that's true for us as believers in Jesus, isn't it? In our faith in him, we are being made into a new creation. Amen? Amen. Now, the last item that we have on the Seder plate is this one called the Zroah, a shank bone of a lamb. Now, the Feast of Passover is also known as the Feast of the Lamb. But one of the major traditions in Judaism today is not to serve lamb at Passover. You see, the lambs that used to be served at the Passover table were the Passover sacrifices, But in 70 AD, the temple was destroyed in Jerusalem, and so was the altar where the sacrifices were performed. So from that time up until today, no sacrifices have been made. So instead, the shame bone, like the egg, the Chagiga, remind us of sacrifices which are no longer offered. Now, the presence of these two elements, the shame bone and the egg, raises a very important question. With no temple, with no altar, with no sacrifices, how can we atone for our sins? Because the, because the law of Moses states very clearly, I've given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls. It is the blood by reason of life that makes atonement. So what do we do today? Well, more, most of you probably would say, well, that's something that God commanded the children of Israel a long time ago. We live in 2019, things are changing, um, modern times. And most of you probably would say, I'm not even Jewish, so that doesn't apply to me. Well, maybe we do live in modern times. Maybe things are changing. But I know someone who doesn't. I think you know him too. God doesn't change. And his principles don't change either, right? Whatever is required of the children of Israel, my ancestors a long time ago, he requires the same thing from all of us, whether we're Jewish or not, and doesn't matter if it's 2019, 2026, it doesn't matter. The same principle apply. Without shedding of blood, there's no atonement. Sounds familiar? The same principle. So what do we do today? Well, more than 2,000 years ago, there lived a Jewish man called Yohanan, and you might know him better as John, John the Baptist. And one day, when he was baptizing people in the River Jordan, he saw another Jewish man approaching, and he said of him, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And that's how we can have atonement even today. The same principle that was then, but not through the sacrifices of the Passover lambs that were done each year at Passover, that were covering the sins of the children of Israel for one year, and they needed to be done again and again and again. But through the sacrifice of the Lamb, the Lamb of God, whose sacrifice was done once and for all. Isn't that a great reason to rejoice? I think so. I'm glad some of you think so too. But see, now we come to the second cup, the cup of plagues. Now, in Jewish tradition, a full cup represents complete joy. But in a sense, our joy is not complete, as we remember the plagues that were poured on the Egyptians. So at this point in the service, we pour out some of the contents of this cup, as we remember each plague in particular. But not only that, there's an important lesson in this cup. See, Pharaoh defied the will of God. He was repeatedly told by God what he wanted him to do. But each time, his heart got hardened. 
And he said, no, I refuse, I will not. As a result, he brought death and destruction not only upon his land, but into his own home. Remember, his own son died. His firstborn son died because of his hardness of heart. And how often we act like Pharaoh. We know God's will for our lives. We know what he requires of us. And we still say, I want to do things my way. So the lesson of this cup is, if God speaks to you even today, do not harden your heart. If, for example, God speaks to you even today, even tonight, about accepting the sacrifice that Jesus did on the cross for you so you can enjoy the blessing of the new life that he has in, in, in mind for you, the, 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 <coughs> sorry, the one that you were designed to have for, for, that can start now for, or eternity in God's presence. Do not harden your heart, but make this the day that you say yes to Jesus. No matter much we try our own own, that's not going to happen. We need God's solution. So, yielding to God's solution, that's the best decision that we can ever make. So, if you haven't done that yet, make this the day that you say yes. And maybe some of you you've, you've, you know, will say, probably, I've, you know, I, I've done it. I accepted Jesus as my personal Messiah and Savior a long time ago or maybe just recently. So this lesson doesn't apply to me. Actually, even as believers in Jesus, maybe there are some areas of our lives that we still hold on to, doing things our way rather than his way. So the lesson of this cup is for all of us, even as believers in Jesus. So if there are areas of our lives that we do things our way rather than his way, like, for example, uh, emotions like um, bitterness, unforgiveness, um, finances, uh, relations, if you're a child of God, you can hear his voice. So if we hear his voice today, let's not harden our hearts, but let's make him the Lord of our entire lives. Because as I said before, the night of Passover is a night of celebration and a night to thank God and a night to praise Him. And I can praise God not only because He redeemed the children of Israel, my ancestors, from bondage and slavery to Pharaoh in Egypt, but because I've been redeemed, you've been redeemed from an even greater bondage through our faith in the Messiah, Jesus. Because through faith in Him, we pass from death unto new life. So the way that we Jewish people celebrate that new life is by having a wonderful, sumptuous meal. But instead of the meal, I'll go to the time after the meal. And after the meal, we come to the most important part of the service, the third cup, the cup of redemption. But we can't continue just here because something is missing. If you remember earlier, something was broken, buried. It's now, it's, now it's time to bring it back. Now, all the children are searching for the afikoman. It's a game that, that's part of the, of the whole celebration. All the children are going around looking for, for, for the afikoman. This is the time that it's later in the, in the ceremony. Um, and unfortunately, only one gets to find it. And once it's found, it's returned to the head of the household. Usually, that's the father. Um, actually, he has to redeem it with a prize. The prize can vary from household to household. It can be a dollar or a Porsche or... Um, <laughs> Just kidding. Probably a dollar would be the most. I just wanted to see if you're still awake. And if I woke you up, I'm sorry. But once he has it, he takes it and then breaks it again in small pieces like these, olive-sized pieces. And this olive-sized piece of afikoman is taken along with the third cup, the cup of redemption. Now, does this look familiar? It should, because this is the origin of our communion service. Where else can we find a better picture of our Messiah Jesus than in this custom concerning the Afikoman? Remember, um, 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 leaven symbolizes what? Sin. So unleavened bread reminds us of sinlessness, the sinlessness of Jesus. But not only that, consider this. Our rabbi sets the very specific regulations concerning the appearance of the matzah. In order for it to be uh, used for Passover, it has to have two requirements. In the first place, it has to be striped. You're more than welcome to come and I hope you can see it. If not, you're welcome to come and take a closer look at it uh, at the end of the service. It's striped. 
Well, Jesus was striped, and with his stripes, we are healed. In the second place, it has to be pierced. And the only reason I'm holding it to the candle so you can see the piercing. Can you see the holes? Well, Jesus was pierced, and they shall look upon him whom they have pierced. But I can see our Messiah Jesus, not only in the Afikoman, but in the Matsatash as well. Remember the pouch from which the Afikoman was taken? Well, there's quite a bit of disagreement among our rabbis concerning the meaning of this pouch, this mysterious three in one. Some of them are saying that represents the three patriarchs of Israel, Abram, Isaac, and Jacob. But why is this small matzah broken, buried, and then brought back? Some others are saying that represents the three divisions of worship in the ancient Israelite kingdom, the priests, the Levites, and the children of Israel. But again, why is this small matzah broken, buried, and then brought back? <laughs> I can, yeah, I probably know where I'm going with this. That's good. But, you know, these are just two of the many other explanations. There's so many others, uh, but I don't want to take the time to, do, to, uh, to talk about that. But none of them give a satisfactory answer of why the middle one is taken out, broken, buried, and then brought back. But why search for another explanation? Well, I think we can find the answer in the very design of the Matsatash itself. There are three layers here. And again, you're more than welcome to come and take a closer look at it at the end of the service. There are three layers here, and yet they form a unity, a triunity. And there's a word in Hebrew that might mean just such a unity. The word is echad. And this word was given to us by God through the prophet Moses who declared this word together with other words that are still chanted in synagogues today. So if you have a chance to go to a synagogue, you will hear these words. I'm going to try it. Do that again. Shema, <clears throat> Shema Israel, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And the word used for one is Echad, a unity. And during the Seder, the host removes the middle layer of this unity, this Echad. It is made visible to us, while the two others are hidden from our view. And this reminds me of something that I hope is familiar to you too. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And he came unto his own, but his own received them not. But as many as received them, to them he gave the right to become the children of God. So we Jewish people who believe in Jesus know that the Masatash bears witness to the unity of one God revealed in three persons. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Why is this mill matzah broken, buried, and then brought back? I believe because Yeshua, Jesus in Hebrew, was broken, buried, and then brought back. The night of Passover that he celebrated with his disciples, he took the bread, much like this, unleavened bread, broke it, saying, this is my body given for you and you and you, for all of us, do this in remembrance of me. And the fruit of divine Passover is always red. Our rabbi say it's to remind us of the precious blood of those lambs that were sacrificed so that we, that we might be, um, be able to be redeemed from bondage and slavery to Pharaoh. Well, in the same way, the precious blood of another lamb was sacrificed so that we might be redeemed, even today, from bondage and slavery to sin. And it is concerning this cup, that cup taken after the meal, that Jesus said, the cup of redemption. He said, this cup, which is poured out for you, is the new covenant in my blood, the very new covenant promised to us by God through the prophet Jeremiah when he declared, behold, days are coming when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. But not like the covenant which I made with their forefathers when I took them by hand out of the land of Egypt. But this is the new covenant which I will make with the house of Israel. After those, those days, I will put my law within them. And upon their hearts will I write it. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. So the broken piece of the Afikoman is taken along with the third cup, the cup of redemption, in remembrance of the blood and body of the Passover lamb my Passover lamb and yours 
is the Lamb of God himself. Now we come to the fourth cup, the cup of Hallel. Now, without knowing you all, I know that you know a Hebrew word besides Shalom, but I'm not really sure you know it's Hebrew. The word is Hallelujah. Anybody knows what that means? Sorry. <laughs> it means praise the Lord. Well, the first part of this word is Hallel, which means praise. This is the cup of Hallel, the cup of praise. We praise God Almighty for the mighty act of redemption. He just gave it to us free. There's nothing that it's required of us. No, there's nothing that it's, it, it's um, possible for us to, to, um, to purchase that. God himself and the person of Jesus did it all for us on the cross. Isn't that a great reason to rejoice and say hallelujah? Hallelujah. Um, I think this mic, um, it was all capital now, but for some reason some pockets, I think only one pocket here heard me. I, the others, I, I don't know. I'm not really sure that it went through all the building. Shall we try it one more time? Isn't that a great reason to rejoice and say hallelujah? Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. But it's one last cup that I haven't told you about. This is the cup of Elijah. This is a cup from which no one drinks. As a matter of fact, in many Orthodox Jewish homes, an entire place setting is left all untouched for the prophet Elijah. But why such longing for one particular prophet? Well, it's recorded by the Hebrew prophet Malachi that before the Messiah comes, he will be preceded by the coming of Eliyahu Hanavi, the prophet Elijah. So each year at Passover, a child goes to the door, opens it wide, hoping that a prophet will accept the invitation, enter the home, and announce the Messiah is coming. Now, I know that Eliyahu, that is Elijah, has already come. For when Jesus spoke of the prophet John, he said of him, if you care to accept it, he himself is Elijah who was to come. So the prophet, the forerunner, has come, and so has the Messiah. And I think you can recognize by now who is the Messiah in the Passover. But unfortunately, most of my people, the Jewish people, celebrate this celebration with all these elements that you see here on the table. And this year, actually, it's going to be uh, the first night of Passover when a table like this will be in every Jewish home. Um, it's going to be on Good Friday. So when you celebrate Good Friday, Jewish people sit down with all these elements, but without knowing the Good Friday that you know. So that is the reason for the ministry of Jews for Jesus. We try to share the good news with our people that the Messiah came in the person of Jesus so they will also have the hope of salvation, the hope of a relationship with God, creator of heaven and earth. So at this point, I'd like to share with you a little bit about the ministry of Jews for Jesus. And in doing so, I'd like to invite you to take out these cards that you received as you came into uh, the sanctuary. Um, you can see this, um, this, this card is basically made out of two, two cards. Uh, there's that my, my picture and my husband's picture there, on our name. And also there's a larger card. So if you take it and bending it, you'll bend it back and forth on that perforation. Uh, you'll you'll um, um, detach it. This card is for you to keep. Maybe um, you can put us on your fridge. Because I know that you're going to go there at least three times a day. So you can see that, oh, I better pray for these guys that they will see more Jewish people come to know Jesus as their Messiah and Savior. See, it started with us, the message. God gave it to us to pass it on to the rest of the world. Now, the first Jews for Jesus did a great job. Otherwise, you and I wouldn't be here tonight, right? Now, the message needs to go back to them. So we need your prayers that people will, Jewish people all over the world, will come to know Jesus as their Messiah and Savior. Jews for Jesus is an organization that's all over the world. Where there's a Jewish community, we'll, uh, most of most those places will be there. Uh, my husband and I are in Sydney, Australia. So you can remember to pray for this, this, um, this couple, that God will lead them to more Jewish people. And uh, the, the other card is for you to, to not, not to keep, that's to keep, this one is uh, for you to fill out with your details on the front and the back of the card. If you'd like to receive our free newsletter that's designed specifically for Christians and tells you more about the Jewish roots of your faith, much like I've shared with you tonight, and also 
uh, will, um, the newsletter will tell you how you can pray for us so we'll see more Jewish people come to know Jesus uh, as their Messiah. Another way that you can <clears throat> be involved in our ministry is by um, uh, financially. Uh, in a few moments, as was mentioned earlier in the service, there will be a, a love offering for our ministry, so be able to continue doing the work. Um, so there's a plank, blank on the card that you can put the amount of your gift to us. You don't have to give in anything in order to receive the free newsletter. Uh, but if God puts you in your heart to give to the ministry of Jesus, Jesus, uh, again, you don't even have to put the, um, the, the amount, but also that will enable us to send you a receipt. And also we'd love to thank you personally for your gift to us. Um, the, the way that we share the gospel with people is... Um, primarily meeting with Jewish people uh, on a one-to-one -one basis or in uh, groups of uh, teaching Bible studies. Um, and that's an opportunity for us to actually um, bring the gospel into their lives. Uh, and I'd like to share with you with just one person that, just, um, um, that I've been meeting for, um, for a while now. Um, it's a, a young lady of 93 years old called Helen, uh, she, um, every time I would meet with her and I share the gospel and, and I read, you know, scriptures with her and I pray for her, I would ask her if she wants to receive Jesus as her Messiah and Savior. And every time she would say, I'm not ready yet. I'm not ready. Um, but I would still continue doing the same thing, asking her this question because you never know. Uh, but one day, just recently, um, I went to see her, and she says, I hear this melody, um, but I don't know where it's coming from. Uh, it could be, is it maybe from across the street where there's a school or a neighbor or um, a car passing by? Um, so I, I don't know what it is, where it's from. And so I asked her, can you hum it? Can you, do you know the words to that? Well, she knew a few words. She, she, she um, knew the melody, but just a few words here and there. Now, um, I didn't know much about that. Uh, I, I mean, I didn't know the words, but I, immediately she started singing that, and she has a better voice than me. She's, I, I can recognize it's a hymn. You see, when she was uh, uh, little, her parents, even if she grew up, she's Jewish and she grew up Jewish, her parents sent her to a Christian school because that was the best school in, that, in her area. Uh, so that's where she heard about Jesus, she, although she stayed away from that, but also learned some hymns. And so um, that's where, you know, sort of like in that melody came, came from. And, um, but I didn't know the hymn. I knew it was a hymn, but I didn't know it. But I knew that the words are important. So um, I tried to Google it, try to find out, you know, based on the little words that she knew, what it was all about, and I couldn't find it. After a while, she says, just wait a second. So she goes into another room, comes back with a little book of hymns. And this one, this book, is a, it's a piece of history because this book is she had since she was eight or nine years old. Remember, she's 93 years old now. This is a piece of history. And so I opened it and tried to find out the words that, based on what the words that she mentioned, and I found it. So it's amazing. <coughs> and I'll actually, let me see if I can find it here. Um, the words. Hold on a second. Just bear with me for a second. Yeah, I think I got it. Um, Glorious things of thee are spoken. I'm not going to sing it because it's you know, just the words. Glorious things of thee are spoken, Zion city of our God. He whose word cannot be broken, form thee for his own abode. On the rock of ages founded, what can shade thy sure repose? With salvation's walls surrounded, thou may smile at all thy foes. Anybody recognizes this? Yeah? Cool. 
I mean, you can sing, <laughs> you probably can sing it. I, I, I wouldn't want to even attempt that. See, I knew once I found out this is a hymn and I found the words, I found out that actually this melody didn't come from the school next door, didn't come from a neighbor, didn't come from a passing car. It was God himself speaking to Helen. Now, I didn't. She says she heard it while I was there. I didn't hear it because it wasn't for me. It was for her. God spoke directly to her the right words that she needed to hear. Um, so this, the, I knew that, I, I didn't know much about it, but I knew the words are important. And once I found the words, I knew that God is preparing Helen for his heavenly abode. And so I shared the gospel with her again, and I asked her again, do you want to receive Jesus as your Messiah and Savior? And this time she said yes. She responded not to me, but she responded to God's calling. So now Helen is a brand new creation. She's a child of God. Um, so pray for Helen that, that God will continue to help her in her walk with the Lord, that would show her mercy and provide her needs uh, to her um, the way that he does for all of his children, right? And so pray with us that there will be more Jewish people like her that will come to know Jesus as her Messiah and Savior. Like her, you know, there'll be others that would respond, not necessarily to us speaking to them, but to God himself who's calling them back home because that's what it's all about, right? So this is just a, <clears throat> a small sort of snippet of a little bit of my work. You know, my official title is missionary or a Bible teacher, but actually I'm a midwife, and that's the best work, job that I can ever have where I see a new creation forming right in front of me. That's, it's, it's so exciting to me. And you know what? It's not just a person like myself who is a missionary or a Bible teacher or a pastor who can be a midwife. Each one of you can be one, right? All we need to do is respond to God's calling us to share what he has for us, the way that he saved us, the way that he, by his mercy, called us back home. We will do the same for others. Now, I will be back at that table where I have some literature, and um, uh, I'll be more than glad to answer any questions you might have about uh, what I said today or about, um, about Jesus. And, and primarily, if you have a Jewish friend or relative, I'll be more than happy <clears throat> to see about how I can help you share, um, share the gospel with, with that Jewish friend or relative. So please come and talk to me. I'll be happy to to uh, meet you at the end of the service. Thank you so much.